Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Take Back Mondays, the number one podcast for entrepreneurs, creatives, and experts who want to escape their nine to five and love Mondays again. Uh, today, I have a very special guest for you. It's taken me a while, but I finally got him to come onto the show. I am so excited to present to you today the famous Tim Denning. Uh, Tim, for those of you who don't know, is a top LinkedIn and Medium writer who has amassed an impressive amount of views in a short time. Um, he is one of the most amazing writers I have yet to see. And I am a content creator who regularly consumes all the best content. So that's a, a big thing. And he's also been featured in Entrepreneur Magazine, Business Insider, CNBC, and much more. Welcome to the show today, Tim. Thanks for having me. It's uh, taken a bit of time to get here, but we finally made it happen. Well, I understand you've got a very busy life right now. A lot of things in the works in your personal and your pri your professional life. Um, so tell us, Tim, um, you know, my first question is to let my, my, my readers know that you actually embody what I do on this podcast, which is to escape your nine to five. So before we even dive into what you're doing now and what you've accomplished, I'd like to take ourselves back into your past for a quick minute and talk about how you escaped the dreaded nine to five. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's a long story that I actually don't, I'll, I'll try and shorten it, but there's many parts that you probably don't even know, even though we've known each other for a while. Um, so look, the long and short of it is in my early 20s, uh, I started a business with my brother. Uh, it was an online e-commerce company. We built it up to over 100 employees. I left behind that business when I was 26. I had all sorts of issues, but probably the biggest issue was I was suffering like debilitating mental health issues that were undiagnosed. I wasn't aware. And so um, I ended up going and working in a bank in a call center. It was a you know minimum wage type job. I would define it as like borderline slavery. You're tied to the phone. Uh, if I wanted to go to the toilet, it was all timed with like a stopwatch on the computer. Uh, if you took too many toilet breaks in one day, you basically got a warning. You get three of those, you get fired. So, it, you know, it was like a prison in a way. Um, and I kind of got lucky because around the end of the first year of that, my team all got made redundant. So there's 35 of us and I was gutted because I was, you know, it was the only job I had. And I found out that I was actually going to get transferred to another building. So same company, but working in like a bigger skyscraper with essentially a call center, but not the same restrictions. And so I started doing that um, and eventually sort of climbed my way through working in the bank by being in the right building and which was the right place at the time. Um, and while I was working in that bank in all sorts of different jobs, I started writing online on the side. So this is now eight and a half years ago. And I was writing on a blog called uh, addictedtosuccess.com. It's just a, a WordPress blog. It still exists today, but it's probably not quite as big as what it used to be. Um, and I, was, I just found that on Facebook, I was just reading that. So I was more of a reader and I thought, oh, that's interesting. Um, and I ended up going over to Perth here in Australia and meeting the, the founder of that particular blog. And I had no intention of like ever writing on it, but he said to me, oh, you work in a bank, you're dealing with entrepreneurs every day. You know, do you reckon you might be able to write about them? And so the way I got the meeting with him was that I, I pitched him and said like, I could get you clients for your podcast because I'm working in a bank and you know, I'm dealing with like the founders of you know, Uber and Netflix and these types of big companies. Because of that, I have, I'm in touch with them. Therefore, I can ask him those types of things. So then he said to me, instead of putting them on my podcast, why don't you translate those into articles? So I started writing, they were basically like recorded interviews and then I would translate them into articles. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was pretty boring, but I eventually, as I was doing that process, I ended up writing about how I was dealing with mental health issues. And I just published it on the website. And that article went mega, mega viral. It had at the time 84,000 shares. So not likes, not comments, but actual shares on Facebook. And that was when I kind of realized, ah, oh, like maybe there's something more to just, you know, basically transcribing podcast interviews. Maybe you can actually write online. Um, so I did that on the side. I was basically like bored, you know, dealing with mental health issues, trying to inspire other people who are in kind of a difficult spot. And um, eventually over the years, right, so, you know, eight years of working there, 
uh, actually, sorry, seven years, because I quit my nine to five job exactly one year today or around about one year today. Um, so May of 2021. Um, and I was just doing it on the side, but the money and what, like all the work that I was doing started to become more important than my nine to five. So I didn't just quit, which is what a lot of people do. I actually wound back my hours to four days a week. And so I started working Saturdays and Thursdays. And I did that for about two and a half years. So I probably did it for way longer than I needed to. And then after I did that and it was successful, I kind of realized, well, this is like becoming a, a full-time thing. So then I quit the job last year and I've been doing that for one year straight ever since. So that's the, uh, the full journey. <laughs> I love that because a lot of my readers are aspiring to do something like that and they have no idea how to get started. And so it's really inspiring to hear that telling your authentic story was the catalyst that started the ball rolling. Um, especially with mental health, which is absolutely something that needs to come out of the closet because it affects so many more people than we know. And I, I think it's about time that we started integrating that into the everyday work discussions, just like we talk about communication skills or vacation policies. We should be talking about mental health a lot more. Wouldn't you agree? I do agree, but I found that the, the secret to it was all in the packaging. So the articles that I wrote and even the ones I write today, they often don't say mental health because it's seen as like weak or a little bit taboo. So I repackage it. So it's still mental health, but it doesn't use that label. And that way it kind of gets people in without feeling like they're being judged. So that's one of the ways to get the conversation to happen is to try and remove some of the stigma. Interesting. And I love that. It's like giving them permission to talk about a topic that they may be avoiding otherwise. Um, so you started writing on addicted to success, which I know about very well. It's one of mm -hmm. the maybe not oldest, but like for me, it's, it's the pre medium days when I think right. about addicted to success. Um, and then you, you moved over to medium and, and LinkedIn, or should I say you expanded to those platforms in what order did that happen? Oh, this is testing my memory. So addicted to success was definitely first or was it LinkedIn? Oh, I can't remember. I'm pretty sure I was addicted to success and it was LinkedIn shortly after, but LinkedIn, I was just republishing my addicted to success articles there. And then when I was doing research, I noticed when I was doing Google searches that this website called medium kept coming up, it was everywhere in Google search at the time. And the reason was they'd mastered SEO. And so I kept seeing it come up and initially I was like, I don't want to write another platform. I already don't have time. I'm working a job. So I just started copy and pasting my addicted to success articles over there and like doing a, a link back to the original one. And I was allowed to do that. Like it was my content. Um, and I started doing that and I realized, Oh, actually this is like, this is really interesting. This is sort of like, it doesn't, you don't require a WordPress blog anymore. They've basically disrupted that whole space. And so eventually I stopped just reposting on there and I started writing exclusively on there. Um, but what's weird with the addicted to success stuff, I actually kept that going for a very long time. Um, I think I only finished up writing on there maybe two years ago. So out of the eight years, like I was writing on there for a very, very long time. Um, so you don't need to necessarily just delete things and you can already kind of get a sense that I don't just chop and change between stuff. It's a little bit more strategic. There's a bit more patience involved. Um, otherwise, you end up just jumping all over the internet and never actually finding a home for your content or your writing. And so I'm really big on, on not doing that too much. Um, and recently in the last year, I've probably done a little bit more of a pivot. I'm doing a lot more on Twitter now than I've ever done before. I suspect that's going to become a big part of what I do in the future. And then I've turned my own website to be now the home of everything. And then the other platforms is just where I duplicate what's on my website. Um, and that's just because once you get to a certain point, it does make sense to actually have your own website and have that be the home. But for 99% of people, especially anyone working a job or entrepreneurs, I don't recommend it because there's a lot of stuff you got to do. And you got to remember with a website, people can't find it, right? Whereas if you publish stuff on LinkedIn and Twitter, it's got an audience built in. So for most people, social media is actually a better place to start than a website. I love that because a lot of entrepreneurs listening 
especially those who are still in nine to five jobs, they hear contradictory advice about should I, do I need a website? Should I start with a website? But as a business coach and then talking to you as a successful writer, I'm happy that we both agree on the advice that in the beginning, you're not famous. You don't have the SEO and SEO is a long-term game. So if somebody has mastered it like LinkedIn, obviously they have so much power of SEO or Facebook or wherever it is, go there and then draw people back once they start following you to a home. Um, and I would even add more as a business coach to tie it back to your email list, which I know you got to in the end, but in the beginning, a lot of new writers don't realize the importance of being seen. And so go to those platforms and then later on, get people to subscribe, not just to that platform, but get them off the platform. That's a whole different conversation, but I know you have that experience. Um, so before we go further, I want to know between LinkedIn and Medium. So now you, you house everything at timdenning.com, but do you still, so LinkedIn and Medium are now more distribution channels for pieces of content or how has that changed now? Yeah, um, so Medium, you can actually republish stuff from your own website using canalocial links. So that way the SEO authority goes to your own website, but it's republished there. And I have a big audience there, so I don't want to not write on Medium, but I just started to think to myself, oh, I want somewhere to be a home um, and I don't necessarily want that to be a social media platform because I don't control the look, the feel, you know, all those, it's sort of like there's a wall between me and the reader. And I like the idea of having that removed on my own website. Um, LinkedIn is different. So one thing a lot of people stuff are blog posts on LinkedIn don't work. They deprioritize those many, many years ago. I mean, the feature is still there, but like you'll get very poor engagement. So I don't republish stuff in that sense. What I do, which is quite new, is I um, have a LinkedIn newsletter. So that's a quite a new feature for LinkedIn. And that's essentially the same thing as the old feature, but it's just kind of repackaged. And what's strategic there is I don't just grab anything. This is where a lot of people stuff up. They copy and paste content from one place to another place. No, 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 no. Every platform has nuances. And for example, LinkedIn, I've just been doing it for so long. I know like, for example, what topics should be on there and shouldn't be on there. I know that in the headline of an article, I don't put life lessons, I change it to business lessons, right? Even if it's the same article, I'll still edit the headline or I wrote one the other way. These are things that like successful people do. And I just added the word, these are things successful business people do, right? And then I'll go through the article and I'll go, all right, is there any swear words? Because I can't have that on LinkedIn, right? Someone's boss is looking while they're reading that article. They don't want to look bad. Um, I'll look to see if there's like pictures that maybe don't quite work for LinkedIn. Um, and so I just, I, I'm very careful about what topics I do and don't put in that LinkedIn newsletter. Um, and that's, that's where I see a lot of people mess up is they just copy and paste medium content and the vice versa. They do the same over medium. They take a LinkedIn piece of content and just throw it up on medium. And the reality is career content on medium is not really a huge topic. Um, and some of it can work, but again, there's nuances and that's where a lot of people mess up on social media. They sort of, the platforms are easy enough that you can whack stuff up there pretty easy, but it's about all the different nuances and what all the different buttons do that people miss. And I go a step further, right? So I look at the psychology of a platform. And so every platform I've mastered, like who's on there, how do they think, how do they engage? So I know on LinkedIn, for example, people are very self-conscious because their boss is watching, they got their customers there. They're trying to look smart so they can get a promotion or a bonus. So when I'm writing, I have all that stuff in the back of my mind. How do I get the person that benefit that they're trying to get? On Medium, it's very different. It was born in Silicon Valley. You have a large amount of like entrepreneurs, tech people, developers, people that write code, uh, cryptocurrency. A lot of that is embedded deep, deep in the culture of the platform. And so when you're writing, even if it's an article about life lessons, I know that I want to touch on some of those, um, I forgot what they're called. I'll say culture, but there's, there's a better word for it. Um, and I want to touch on that uh, so that it's, it's nuanced to that particular audience. And same with Twitter. Like I know on Twitter, I give you a great example. One of the biggest audiences on Twitter is males in their 20s. 
A lot of people don't know that. So when I'm writing, I'm thinking like, what's a male in their 20s need to know about writing or careers or whatever it might be? And sometimes in the headline, I'm even addressing it like, if you're in your 20s, this is how you should write online, those types of things. So I've taken the time to know, therefore, I'm not just like randomly throwing stuff up and hoping it's going to connect. And so I think that's what a lot of people miss with these platforms. I love that you said that because just before this conversation, I was I was downloading this huge file that I recorded on an online platform. And I was talking exactly about this. This was a social media masterclass that I've recorded uh, that's mm-hmm. going to be on my website for free. Um, and I was just talking about not thinking that it's a one size fits all, that you really need to educate yourself if you need to succeed on that platform, because you want to touch the audience on that platform, take the time to invest in a course with somebody who has already succeeded, who's cracked the code. Because if you just go up there and try to wing it or take the strategy that made you a star on Twitter and think, oh, I'm now I'm just going to be a LinkedIn star, you will fail. You really do need to pay attention to the nuances. So the devil is in the details, literally on social media. Um, so I love, love, love that advice. So, so you've mastered Medium, you've mastered LinkedIn. Now you're attacking Twitter. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm watching you, Tim. I'm watching all the moves you're making. I love it. I love what you've, I can, it's, for me, it's almost like a game to watch people like you and dissect what I think you're doing or speculate like, ah, there. And then I look for patterns in what you're doing. And like, there, he did it again. And then I analyze it. Um, so it would be really interesting uh, to start like a podcast where that's all we do is like take writers like you or content creators and be like, okay, look at that style. Look at that style. I'll give you a clue, something you can't see. Uh, so what you can't see is that a lot of what happens on these platforms, it happens behind the scenes in direct messages. So it's no accident that like things go viral. Now for me, to be honest, I don't actually have the time to, manufacture like a lot of people do but one of the success ingredients is that people are sharing each other's content behind the scenes right they're partnering up they're becoming friends they're learning from each other a great example is mr beast he has one of the largest youtube channels in the world i've listened to many podcasts he's obsessed with youtube and when he first started and even to this day he's in a group chat with i think about seven or eight other youtubers and they all reshare each other's stuff share what the latest you know, tweaks are that are happening on YouTube. They're basically making friends. They're networking behind the scenes. And I think a lot of that is missed. I didn't do that for a very long time and it it really stopped the growth. But once I started getting around other people who were trying to do the same thing as me and we started going, and we're in the same niche as well. So it's not like some people may have heard the term, you know, engagement pod. It's not that where you're like forced to like and share each other stuff. It's just that you're friends with those people and you get value out of what they're doing. And so you naturally in organic way kind of engage with them. And so, you know, that's something that, that happens. We help each other a lot behind the scenes and you just can't see it. Um, So that's one of the the tricks. Well, I love that you said that because the masterclass I just recorded was exactly about community and the value Mm -hmm. of collaboration over competition. So if like you and I, for example, uh, we both, I found you because I like entrepreneurship. And I first started really understanding that that was the niche I wanted to really um, start my solo business in, helping new entrepreneurs. Um, And that's how I discovered your content. So everything is discoverable based on niching down by keywords. So you have to pick, and you've done a really good job of picking two, right? Entrepreneurship and then life lessons. And if I would guess your ICA, ideal customer avatar is probably male in their twenties. Maybe I, I, funny enough though, if I look at my customer list, it's actually not male in, in their twenties. It's, it's a very broad mix, but typically it's either someone that wants to become a content creator or is a content creator. And then the second category that's much newer, like I'd say the last three months is people that want to make money online. Right. And I just think that that's a topic that back to what you kind of said before, 
when people fail on these platforms, they assume it's a scam or it doesn't work. So when they hear that, oh, and you can make money online doing this, they instantly, not everyone, but a lot of them think are skeptical and think, no, that's not possible. And I'm starting to change people's minds because I'm just throwing so many examples and I'm going, no, you can make money, but it's not what the gurus will tell you that you can make a million dollars. I think for a lot of people, that's probably unrealistic, but can you replace your nine to five job with $10,000 a month? hundred percent you can. And like, that's, that's what I've figured out how you would actually do that. Right. Well, that's um, the purpose of this podcast. I'm trying to bring people like you to the spotlight to motivate those who maybe don't have in their immediate environment, any role models who have left the nine to five successfully. So their elders, their traditional role models are telling them that's all a pipe dream of the fake gurus. And it doesn't exist on one hand though, you have to admit, because you and I are both consuming content around our expertise, entrepreneurship, you have to admit that the topic is getting oversaturated with how to make money online. If you go to medium.com, it's like how to become a medium top writer, I think is the most popular topic. Um, and you've done a pretty good job of not completely falling into that trap because I've seen some other top writers who just turn around and that's all they talk about. And after a while, it's like, well, I used to enjoy their content because they actually had meaningful articles. And now it's all about how to make a quick buck. And it can, so there's a fine line between, you know, teaching people and then overdoing a topic. Yeah, I'm always afraid in that category as well of exactly what you're saying. Uh, but I'll challenge one thing that someone said to me, whenever a market is saturated, what they're really telling you is that it's actually a market full of opportunity. So that's what it is. You're seeing a lot of it, 99% of it is garbage. So if you can just put something into that category that's high quality, then the fact the market is saturated is great. I don't ever want to be in an unsaturated market because that means it's not validated. It's not data backed. So that was, that was a quote I read. I think his name was Lawrence King, who kind of got me onto that idea. And now I've started resharing that a lot that I love when I hear market saturated, that means opportunity. I love that you said that. And I think that the, the point is when you want to become a content creator, you need to be very data focused. So you need to know exactly what people are searching for and keep up to date about what's your most popular articles in the past. What are the most popular articles in your industry? What are, you know, there's all these amazing tools that we use on different platforms to help us get that data. And then no, if that's very popular, it means a lot of people care about that topic. They're searching up those things, but here's the challenge. And that's what you've done really well is how to talk about that topic without sounding just like everyone else. So, and what have I found as a marketer is you have to be a little bit polarizing. So my tip to anyone listening to become, you know, like Tim, and I'm interested in what he thinks is if everyone's talking about that topic, great. It means people are, are looking for that solution. But if you just start writing exactly like 99% of everyone else about it, what, what makes you legit? So stand out, have a very different opinion, or maybe even in the title, say exactly the opposite of what everyone else is saying, because, and then explain and justify why, um, because otherwise in a saturated market, you're toast. There's no chance. Would you agree with my assessment? Yeah. So polarizing is definitely something that I teach people. It's unfortunate though. I kind of wish that that wasn't the case and that things didn't need to be as polarizing as they are, but that's just the nature, unfortunately, of the current version of social media that we operate in. Anyone that's followed myself will know that I believe we are heading into a web three social media, which will be totally different to what we have now. I won't bore everybody. You can Google my name in web three. I've written about it a lot, but the, the days of like giving content away to platforms for free in return for no money, they are quickly coming to an end. Um, and having, you know, gate, gatekeepers control what content is and isn't seen, that, that will end. Um, but yeah, polarizing, unfortunately, is something that, that has to happen a little bit it, it's to some degree. I do think you can stand out by, you know, putting some emotion in there. A lot of stuff I read is very dry. 
and it just comes across as like facts and figures. Um, so, you know, putting your story or some emotion into the article definitely se separates you. And I see hardly anyone do that. Even though I talk about it all the time, I still don't see anyone do it. Um, so that's a, like an easy way to kind of not have to rely on the polarization as much. Um, to try and reinvent a category, like I write a lot about writing, but I tell people there are writers and online writers. Writers will go bankrupt and they're becoming extinct because they rely on book deals and they rely on gatekeepers of publications to get where they want to get, yeah, I get to. Whereas with online writers, we basically just publish in public. Um, we're permissionless. We just do whatever we want. We run an email list. Uh, we believe in writing short tweets. We believe in being concise. We put beautiful white space in between paragraphs so it's easier to read. So in that sense, you can actually create your own category. And I learned that from my friend, Nicholas Cole. Um, he runs a, a program all about that kind of stuff. And he taught me uh, that you need to like redefine the category. So entrepreneurship, for example, I write a lot about it, but I also figured out that that category got very exhausted because people, the, la the label of entrepreneur makes people think they need to be special and they need to go and get an MBA. So what I figured out is that that's why I change it to make money online. That's, that's what I call entrepreneurship or even side hustle is just another label for it because it sounds like it's achievable because it is. Because if you're working your job, you're kind of already a business owner in a way, right? You're running a certain department or process or customer set, whatever it is. And so I actually don't use the label entrepreneur as much as I used to because I don't want people out there thinking they need to be Elon Musk because that's 99% of people can't do that. But can they make money online $120,000 a year? Absolutely, they can. So that's, again, another example of like you can redefine these categories and that's how you stand out. I love that. And words matter. Words matter because we're cultural beings and we all have our own history and trigger words and things get lost in translation. So um, this is really great. So segue into who do you admire in the writing world? Because you just named one of them who is a, another amazing writer. Um, so tell me, tell me a little bit about who motivates you to write better. Yeah, I actually came pre-prepared with a few because I didn't want to forget <laughs> them. So I want to put it into like, this is another thing that kind of annoys me about content creators is that often the famous ones get all the attention and the amateur ones are sort of ignored. So I'm very big on like the up and comers. And that's why I've always loved Medium because Medium isn't where you go to read the pros. Medium is where they like work in progress, people figuring it out go. And that's hopefully everyone listening or watching this podcast. So my favorite unprofessional unknown writers are Sean Kernan, my friend Io on Medium. Now, I, I don't know how to say his last name. So you just have to go Medium Io if you want to find him. We'll put it in the uh, show notes. In the we'll, show notes, yes. We'll find it, yeah. Uh, <laughs> another guy who English is actually his second language. His name is Alberto Garcia. He's a new up and comer. He's on fire at the moment. He's also on medium. Uh, my good friend, Nick Goki, G-O-K-E. Amazing, amazing writer. Uh, you'll find him. I think his one is formidatebooks.com um, is where you'll find him. He's really great. Another friend of mine from Spain, Mike Thompson or Michael Thompson. Absolutely phenomenal writer will blow your mind strongly suggest looking at him and then in terms of professional writers you know the classics i like ryan holiday for stoicism and i like tim ferris for his kind of practical you know biohacking type stuff um they're you know on the more extreme end they're, they're two as well that i always recommend people suss out well you named several that i know and like as well so that's i love what you said about medium it's definitely a platform people should check out because you don't feel that traditional power play of the big publications. You can just go there and use it as a testing ground. And I'm a big fan of co-creation. So I talk to my audience a lot about how you don't have to go over in your bubble and prepare this amazing book or course and then put it out there and it fails completely and falls flat. On the contrary, go out there and write it chapter by chapter on medium.com and get gauge the reactions, talk with the, your audience, see what resonated most with them. And then, you know, like you said, we, we don't have to have that traditional book publishing mentality anymore. No, no, I, I definitely am one of those data backed writers. I mean, I teach people when it comes to writing eBooks that each chapter of your eBook is kind of something you've already published elsewhere. 
I do. Um, I know the traditional advice is to stick with what's popular. I am starting to sway a little bit more in the other direction where sometimes popular can be a false signal where there are things that I've written where it wasn't popular, but it was for something that I couldn't control. Maybe I published at the wrong time. Maybe I did it over a, a long holiday. Uh, so sometimes I'll republish things and I'll notice like the second and third time that it actually does what I thought it would have done in the first place. And sometimes like popular ideas are not always great ideas. Sometimes they're the dumbest ideas as well. So I'm starting to rethink that popular and you're hearing me just kind of talk about it. I haven't got a final opinion, um, but just something for everyone to think about that just because it has the most likes doesn't always mean it's the best thing that you could put in your book um, as an example. Well, I'm just going to go back one step. Earlier, you talked about the power of community and behind the scenes, all the DMs and people who are supporting each other, like Mr. Beast and like you now have realized that, but staying away from engagement pods, this is the reason. What you just said is the number one reason. And it's so tempting. I get pitched all the time. As soon as you get to a certain level, people are coming at you, join my pod. We need you in this pod. The reason you don't do engagement pods is because it will not help you gauge your true popularity. The only way to gauge true likability and is if you're only doing it with people who truly care about that topic. Correct. And they won't lie to you, especially if we're talking, if we're in the same industry. If I share something with you, you'll give me your honest opinion because you can't help but give, you have an opinion. But if I share something about entrepreneurship with, a corporate executive who really has never once crossed their mind, they're not going to be able to give me good feedback. So then you're going to mess up your own data and that's going to boycott your own success. So I'm giving this lesson because so many people fall victim. They just are too tempted to get that like for the dopamine rush. And they go into those engagement pods and they're like, yeah, I'm listening to what you're saying, but I need the clout. I need the authority. So I'm going to fake it. And trust me, in the end, it's just going to hurt you. So be authentic and uh, be willing to take a brutal hit if no one likes your article, but also be willing to rep republish and repurpose. Because like you said, an article that you sincerely feel was good may have just been published at the wrong time. And also remember there's world events like we are right now, as we're recording this, there's a, a war in Ukraine. A year ago, there was still massive amounts of shutdowns due to COVID. So sometimes the article just got published at the wrong time when the tone of the culture wasn't on that topic. So don't just despair, keep it and then republish it later. So, you know, for sure, if you thought it was good, why didn't it get more likes, right? Yeah, I think sometimes people get stuck in there. You got to have a big audience. I'm now learning the other direction. So I'll give some great examples. Um, I've got a friend, he's got like less than a hundred followers. He makes $25,000 a month from a couple of freelancing clients. So that's like, again, hundred followers. I know another guy who's an affiliate of another course that I, I did and um, similar kind of story, like less than a thousand followers and he's making six figures. So this idea that you need this kind of massive audience, I think it's vanity metrics. And we are now getting into like the, the next phase of social media where companies like Instagram, like in Australia, for example, the like number of likes is blocked on Instagram. I can't see anymore how many likes it has. And I think we're getting more into that world. And even me, I'm guilty. I'm not saying that I'm perfect. I'm guilty of it. And even now I'm starting to go, I want to go the other direction. I just want to focus on having like a small audience, but really deep, really strong connections. And I'm sort of over, I'm not trying to build like millions of followers anymore. I'm, I'm way past that now. Um, so something to think about that you don't necessarily need a massive audience. Is there a future in writing? With the explosion of video and TikTok and as somebody who works in marketing and online, all we hear about is video. But I am so drawn to writing and I'm also getting into Twitter more and more like you, something draws me into short, concise, no BS content. That's how I'll, I'll describe it. Like yep. um, short, short content. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with me that there's still a future for writers? There is. The problem is that um, 
writing has changed so rapidly in the, what I'll call the TikTok generation. And Twitter is kind of the TikTok version of writing. And it's just changed so rapidly. Most people haven't caught up. And even Medium is like very guilty of that. They don't really understand where this, where this stuff is heading. And now it's like, yes, writing online will always matter, but it's so rapidly different to where it was like five years ago. You know, WordPress blogs and that are kind of out the door. It's all social media, but then it's like, there's just so many little nuances now to actually make it. You can't just publish like some long form essay that's full of like filler words that has, you know, 2000 word stories in the middle with long chunks of paragraphs. There's just, there's a lot of optimizing that needs to happen. And the best way I'd explain it, I mentioned Sean Kern before. He's one of my favorite writers. Sean writes amazing stuff. What they people don't know, and I'm friends with him, so I know what he does behind the scenes. He ruthlessly edits. I mean, like he'll sit on a piece for a week. He will try and edit out every word that doesn't need to be there. It's like a game. And that's why when you read his stuff, it's so concise and to the point, it almost doesn't feel like a human wrote it. And that's the level, if you want to succeed online with writing, you actually need to be a ruthless editor. And I made a whole course on editing because I went down the rabbit hole and I got fascinated by, wow, this is the difference between the great writers and the ones that are like no longer relevant. It's this editing process. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, well, tell us, tell us a little bit about, about these, these techniques that you have mastered. Um, I know that you're trying to share that right now with the public. So you've developed a course or multiple courses. Tell us more. Yeah. Um, so I built a whole academy. Uh, we're now up to seven courses. It's not something that we kind of promote sort of out to the public necessarily. It's mostly done again, behind the scenes with email list, that type of thing, because it's, yeah, it's just not something that we're trying to grow into like some big brand or anything like that. It's more nuanced than that. Um, but the most successful course that we run is by far the LinkedIn course. And I think it's because it doesn't matter whether you want to be an entrepreneur or you're working a job. LinkedIn is your resume. It's the place that you have to go. It's not going to get replaced anytime soon. Like the Web3 I mentioned before, there's no LinkedIn replacement for many, many years, I suspect. Um, and so we, we kind of built that with those people in mind. And then back to what you said before, we made it so it's just about writing on LinkedIn. We don't get distracted with audio and video and all the other million things that LinkedIn can do. We just focus on the writing. And we try and chunk it down to 15 minutes a day. Like what could you do on LinkedIn for 15 minutes a day that would move either your business or your career forward? Um, so that's by far the most popular one. And then off the back of it, we've started to just look, instead of building courses for platforms necessarily, we're starting to do it more around pain points. So I know, for example, that like writing fast is definitely a pain point. So we built an entire course on, well, how do you write really, really fast, Right. And then um, I know that editing is huge because people, they can't understand like why, why their stuff is not getting traction and someone like Sean's is. So I dissected and I realized a lot of it is just their ruthless editing. So I'm like, all right, how do they do that? So I went on a whole journey and I asked all these people, like, how do they edit? What tools do they use? What's the process? And then I basically distilled that. The point of online courses is to basically save time. Like technically anything can be Googled but the amount of time you would waste trying to figure it all out. And I would still argue, like, especially for LinkedIn, there's a lot of things that are just, that I've never seen mentioned anywhere else. Um, and so I tried to go, all right, well, let's put that in a course. Let's take people through that journey. So at the end, they have something tangible that they can use to build whatever it is. It doesn't have to be a business. Maybe it's a writing career. Maybe it's enough content to eventually publish a book. You'd be surprised like how many people have that dream of publishing a book. Um, so I didn't want to limit anyone too much. And I have this mindset of everyone is already a content creator. And people go, no, I'm not qualified to be a writer yet. And I go, all right, let's, let's wind this back. So you're not an entrepreneur yet. That's okay. You've got a job. So in your job, do you send emails? Yes, you do. Now, do you have to write PowerPoint decks? Yes, you do. And do you put pictures on there? Correct. And do you give presentations as part <laughs> of your job? Yes. So I hate to break it to you, but you're already a content creator. You're using all those skills already. So all we're saying is we're going to apply that to LinkedIn. That's all we're saying. Now, if writing's not for you, that's okay. Maybe you're really great on Zoom calls. Cool. Well, maybe it needs to be videos on LinkedIn or YouTube, whatever it is. So once you start talking to people like that and you train them with that mindset, they, it starts to unlock in their mind, oh, I can actually do this. 
And so it won't surprise you that a lot of what we teach in these courses, we always start with like mindset and psychology. Then we get into the platform and the tools and we go to the nuances. We overload them with case studies because all of this sounds great, but if you can't see people that are actually doing it, it's meaningless. And unfortunately, what I've learned is a lot of people that are doing it, they don't advertise, like especially when it comes to making money online. A lot of the people that are doing it, you can't Google them, you can't find them on Twitter. You won't be able to see how they're making money. So what I've done again, because I either have the friendships or I've gone deep on the topic, I know who they are. I know what they're doing. I even know how much money they're making. So I have an entire library of thousands of these case studies. And every time I launch a course, I take the best of the best from there so that people can actually learn and they can follow these people in their own time to kind of see what they're doing. And so once you kind of lift the curtain, they can see and it makes sense. Whereas even if you had the name, it wouldn't be enough because you wouldn't know what they're doing. So a little bit of a tangent, but that's, that's what's possible. Well, I definitely need to take your course. I'm terrible with editing my own work. It's just like I can put it away and come back to it. And usually I just want to scrap it and start over versus edit, knowing how to edit. But I do think it's a real skill. I don't think editing is easy at all. Um, it's distilling down. Simplicity is the hardest thing you'll ever achieve in your life. I like to say that often because I feel like we, we, we just we're tendency is to overdo it right overdo it and we need to distill it down to the only essential that's so hard yeah i think what helps in these courses you asked before like what's different or like what was the aha moment i probably shouldn't share this but i'm going to anyway so this is not my first time trying to run an online academy this is actually my fourth time so the first three failed miserably and i tried to partner with different people and it just didn't work And I don't know why, but the magic clicked on this one. And so I have a co-teacher in all these courses because what I figured out is most online courses are boring because I do, a lot of people don't know this, but I do about two online courses every single month. I pay for them and I'm like religiously doing online courses. That's another way that I kind of figure stuff out before a lot of people do. And so I bought a co-teacher in, his name is Todd Bryson. He's also a very popular medium writer, but the two of us were very different. So Todd's dad is like a English teacher. Um, He's very romantic. He's a bestseller on Amazon. He writes traditional stories. He's really obsessed with like punctuation and beautiful sentences. And then you've got me on the other end. I'm sort of like always looking into the future, social media, web three, go, 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 go. And so when you bring those two things together, you kind of get a very different experience. And so it's entertaining as well. Like we're cracking jokes, we're having fun. and so. I think like there's a lot of lessons in how we do these courses for entrepreneurs as well. Like that's, I think one of the reasons we're being successful this time around because we're doing it way, way different to anything else I've seen. And so because it's engaging, you actually complete the course. Like a lot of online courses, people never finish them. With ours, we have a very high completion rate. The average student has done three courses, right? And so you start to sort of unlock these types of lessons as you're building. So it's not just, my point here is not just to talk about online courses, but to explain like the first time you do something, whether it's content or business, whatever it is, it may not actually work. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't keep going with it. It just means you probably have to try something different. I fully agree. I think the road to success has to go through failure. So what I like to repeat to people often is fail fast. Congratulations. You should, the faster you fail, the quicker you will actually succeed, but you cannot skip failure. You have to know what sucks in order to figure out what's good. Yeah. There's no, there's no way around it. You're not going to go in your bubble and build this perfect little course. And then it's going to be a bestseller or a book or whatever your, your baby is right. Uh, your content baby. Um, I like that. And I love, I love everything you're saying. Um, it's true. People don't finish courses and, And I think that you also have to do some beta runs. So for me, what's helped me understand courses is is giving it to people and saying, rip it apart. Like I give you this for free. You can, uh, you know, gain the value because I, I, I expect that if you guys are gonna build a course, you're thinking it's for the value, not just the profit. If you're trying to go for profit first, you will fail permanently, not just one time, you will always fail. You have to give more than you've ever given or even what you think is possible to give 
when you create a course, if you're in it to win it, if you're in it for profit, then don't create the course, become an affiliate for someone else who has a great course and who has taken the time. Um, and you should probably do both guys listening if you do want to make money, uh, because I, I'm an affiliate for many other people's courses and I love it. I, if they're good people and I, I validated them, then I know the quality is good, more than happy to promote it. Um, so this is amazing. And these courses for LinkedIn, especially, these are for people who want to become thought leader and be start having a voice where they, they don't know where to go. They don't feel like they have that right now. Uh, content creation can be so overwhelming for people. So this is great. Yeah, that's um, the whole reason. Again, it's not my strength. The co my co-teacher has systematized everything. He's an absolute nerd when it comes to like, he comes up with all these acronyms. Like we did one the other day and he's got this whole maps technique. And he's like, you take the maps and that's how you stack the income streams. And he's got, this is why you always partner with people that are smarter than you, right? And so, yeah, that, that's part of it is like, when you do this kind of stuff, you want to save time and you want frameworks that are like proven. So um, you know, back to what you were saying before, when it comes to testing, like everything we do is data backed. We don't guess, right? I spent stupid amounts of time collecting data on what are the problems that people have, why they're having those problems. And then I specifically target the lessons at those problems. Um, and then you said before, you know, like beta testing, we always get our existing students to do whatever the course is so that we know is this good or bad beforehand. We don't just launch something and hope it's going to be great. We make sure it's great with existing students before we launch it. So there's, there's so many lessons in that for entrepreneurs, I think. Yeah, well, that's another big mistake. I see people trying to launch a course for the wrong reasons at the wrong time. So they're launching the course because they, they think they're going to make passive income and then also the wrong time because they haven't beta tested it. So I've been a coach for a long time. So I know the problems people struggle with when they're building a business. And then I have built courses first and foremost to help my existing customers. And then later on, templatized it, put it online and sold it as a standalone course. Uh, but way before that happened, I was like, how can I get them faster to the results to overcome that problem? How can I explain it better? You know, how, and I, and I tested it on them did it work? And when it works, that's when I'm, I know it's a proven method. Um, and you've definitely done the right things because I've seen your success on LinkedIn and on Medium. So we're going to definitely put this in the show notes. Um, so when someone's listening to this and says, okay, that's fine, but I don't understand the value of LinkedIn. Earlier in the podcast, you said why you like LinkedIn is because unlike Medium, both both people are on there, the typical employee and the business person. So you're hitting up a wider net mm -hmm. in the audience than you would if you go into these specialized platforms, right? So that's one of the benefits. But let's talk to the pessimist listening to this podcast who's like, okay, that sounds nice. He's a good writer. He has a LinkedIn course, but I don't understand LinkedIn. And believe it or not, Tim, this is a problem. I speak with so many amazing people who are thinking about entrepreneurship or have started something who are not at all active on LinkedIn and don't get it. So what are the reasons someone should be active on LinkedIn in your opinion? Yeah, if you're a business owner, then the beauty of LinkedIn is that everyone that is on there to do business. The challenge when you go on Instagram and these other platforms, is you start trying to do business on Instagram, people are like, they, they get annoyed because they're not there to do business. They're there to share their photos and whatever. So again, back to the platform psychology, it's okay to sell on LinkedIn. It's okay to be a coach or a consultant. Those are all very normal things. It's okay to pitch people, right? Obviously not on the first direct message, but like it is okay to do that. But on the other platforms, it's not that you can't, you just have to be way more creative. The other reason is that, I mean, if you've got a job and you're not on LinkedIn, I don't know how people think they're going to get a better job or the next job. I mean, it's all there. We all know, I saw a stat today from Austin Belkic on LinkedIn. He was saying that it's like less than 10% of jobs now are filled with job ads. The other 90% is coming from your network. And where's your network? LinkedIn. So if you're not on there and you're not doing anything at all, 
then you're going to be stuck with in the 10% scrounging around for job ads. And now what do we know about job ads? They're all run by automation, right? Application tracking system, ATS is the official term. So you're going to get stuck in there with artificial intelligence that reads to your resume and sees that it doesn't have a certain university or a certain keyword or whatever. Like that's not the game to play. Um, so again, I'm not suggesting everyone needs to be an influencer or any of this kind of stuff. But if you're not on there, at least like sharing your thoughts, sharing lessons from your career, sharing things about your industry that you're already working, that by the way, you're already sharing via email anyway at work. So all we're saying is repurpose what you're already doing. If you're put to getting, putting together slide decks for work, then chunk those down and turn them into nice little LinkedIn posts about something to do with your industry. Be smart about it. You don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. That's where people get confused. They are back to labels. They hear like, LinkedIn and they all of a sudden think that it's huge. But if I just say to them, oh, it's just like the same, you just send stuff that you're already sending in emails with attachments. It's just that, but like on a different website. I'm like, oh, okay. And you, st you start to change the language and the psychology around it. It's actually very simple. And also to remember like 99% of people, they're not on LinkedIn there, there to judge you or to criticize you. Most people will actually be very lovely to you. Um, you know, you'll get a one or two haters, but like, to be honest, that's probably a few years in anyway. Um, so there's this fear of like being judged or being ridiculed. I just don't see that on LinkedIn. I think it's um, a really easy platform. A couple other reasons I love it. Uh, if anyone is a troll on LinkedIn, you get banned real fast mm -hmm. compared to other platforms. They will just ban you. They have no time. It's professional network. LinkedIn is different because it um, doesn't run off ads. So every other platform, it's free to be on there and then you get served ads. On LinkedIn, yes, they have ads, but that's a tiny part of their revenue. Most LinkedIn users actually pay for LinkedIn premium. So therefore, again, back to the nuance and the psychology, because I'm paying to be on the platform, then I value the platform. I want to be there to consume and I'm thinking differently to where if I'm on Twitter, for example, it's free, I can do whatever I want. So I really like that. And that's why LinkedIn over the years has escaped a lot of the controversy because they're not an ad-driven platform. And I think a lot of people don't know that. Or I actually only realized it recently that that's the reason why they've been so successful and they will continue to be successful because of the memberships. Um, so yeah, I could talk all day about why, but I just think everyone should be at the very least on LinkedIn because you're probably already there anyway. Well, I know we're almost out of time, but I could talk to you easily another hour. Um, I do want, I wanted to address that because I do think some of the listeners might be tuning out because in their minds, psychologically, they haven't used LinkedIn up until now. They just don't, they misunderstand the platform. They've created their own stereotype about it's a boring platform and they're on pla other platforms. But one thing that I, I want to convince people as well, why they should listen to you is because we should always be one step ahead of every platform we're using so that we don't end up um, investing our time and, and personal brand efforts into a platform that has no future for us. And what you said earlier on in this podcast, I just want to repeat it so it doesn't get lost. LinkedIn is not going anywhere. The people, as long as we need jobs, are going to flock back to LinkedIn because psychologically, Where's the first place you go if you think there's going to be layoffs or redundancy? Oh, I better go update my LinkedIn profile very discreetly so my employer doesn't get wind of it. Um, so, and also people are in that money mindset. So they're, they're not relaxing. They're there to really do business. And even if they are there for entertainment purposes, they're not going to be upset if you start talking about your, your writing business or your coaching business. Uh, cause that's pretty much the topics that are normal there. There's not a lot of trolling. And if there, if there is, it's shut down immediately. So you aren't getting judged, um, too harshly. Uh, but the thing about the future of LinkedIn, there's another thing we didn't touch on that people may or may not know is that LinkedIn about a year and a half ago invested a ton of money into the creator economy. What that means is you guys should be paying close attention because unlike other platforms that rely principally on ad revenue, LinkedIn is like, we want to keep you people here. And we, we think we're about ready to be able to compete with the other platforms that are taking traffic for socializing and entertainment. 
And what they've done is they've created a whole department of people who are there to help creators. And I was right. actually um, invited into this into this group to be one of the the creator. Uh, what is it? What what was it called? It's a creator program, basically. That's the name I'm of it. Good. LinkedIn Creator. You're probably in there too, right? Um, so that was by invite only. And then there was an application. They just announced some of the winners in, in India, they're doing it in the U S they're doing it. Um, and what you guys have to understand is they're adding new tools that we didn't have before. They're giving us, uh, this thing called creator mode that you can turn on right now. So it's been officially open to anyone with a LinkedIn account that was not there up until recently. And when you turn on creator mode, you get two amazing features that were not available to just anyone before, which is newsletters, which before you had to, to be invited to have a newsletter. Now you just turn on creator mode and immediately when you click article, you'll see the possibility. Would you like to create a newsletter, add your logo, create a name? And that newsletter hits people's inboxes. So it's really, really powerful because you're using LinkedIn's SEO. You don't have to collect their emails, which you should, by the way, after you've got the newsletter. But sure. think about that. Can you do that on any other platform? If we tried to do that on Facebook, we would pay a lot of money because ads just keep going up. The price of ads keeps going up on Facebook and we don't know what the future of Facebook is. I think people who are investing their money in Facebook right now better think twice, come over to LinkedIn, come over to LinkedIn now because now they're doing all these creator tools. And the second one is LinkedIn Live. Just don't wanna, I wanna make sure you guys know that. Um, and the third one that LinkedIn is investing in that not many people know at all is podcasts. So LinkedIn now allows you to submit. There's a submission form. I have a podcast. I'd like to be listed. And this is very, very new. They're, they're just working on it. And they also have a beta audio program that I'm actually in uh, that I was invited to join. And I have a weekly podcast LinkedIn only show. So this podcast that we're, we're currently on is, um, is my main podcast distributed to all the channels as widely as I can possibly do. But the other one is only on LinkedIn. So it's, it's competing against Twitter spaces, Clubhouse, where you've got these audio only events. Um, so please, if anyone listening isn't convinced by now, uh, then I don't know what to do because LinkedIn has future plans for creators. Uh, so get in now while you can, because as you know, Tim, it's a long game wherever you invest, you're investing your time and effort. So you have to play it smart by getting trained by somebody like Tim, um, how to do this, but also you have to be willing to invest in that platform because if you're looking for like overnight success, then, you know, my advice to you go spend $5,000 on ads. That's my advice to you, because if you really want to grow on any platform, you're going to be in it. You have to be in it for like one to two years to really hit a level where you're seeing um, a major change. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I just want to say one final thing on it. Yeah. The reason why sometimes people are pessimistic on LinkedIn is because it's cool to bash LinkedIn. And one of the reasons it's cool to bash LinkedIn is because it can be, right, in small parts of the platform, cringeworthy. Now, if you understand the psychology, you understand it's cringeworthy because what is LinkedIn? It's the office water cooler, right? It's workplace culture. And I'm sure anyone that's worked a job I have knows that workplace culture is super cringeworthy, right? Leaders like fake praise and they're doing, you know, International Women's Day that they may or may not believe in and all these different things. And so that's just a reflection of what you see on LinkedIn. But just because there's a little bit of cringe stuff on there doesn't mean it's a bad platform. And there's another quote I saw the other day that's like, you know, pessimistic people, they sound really smart when they knock platforms like LinkedIn and they, they feel really cool. But in the end, they have no success and they make no money. It's not about being cool. It's just about like, that's where the people are. You can access them for free. So use it or don't use it. But there's no point bashing a, pro, a, a platform or saying, oh, there's too much of this content on LinkedIn. I saw one the other day. There's too many meme quotes on LinkedIn. Don't worry about it. Just unfollow it and then curate your feed to people that you do like. 
right? There's hundreds of millions of people on there. Obviously, everything you read on there is not going to be good. That's up to you to curate it so that you don't get rubbish in your news feed. And I don't get it because I don't follow people that post that stuff. So Amen. Amen. Another reason not to join engagement pods because your time is so valuable. And what I think of social media is it's either complete rubbish or it's complete value, but you can't have one without the other. So you have to curate, curate, curate. And LinkedIn has recently also introduced a feature of notification bell. So Mm -hmm. next to Tim's profile, I want you guys after this podcast, you're going to get all the links in the show notes. I want you to go to linkedin.com, look up Tim, or just click the link in the show notes and click the bell next to his name, because I truly give people, I'd say, you know, a week or two of my time to follow them so that I really can make a judgment about, do I like their content or not? I never make a judgment based on one post. One post will get you attention, but maybe that was a one hit wonder, or maybe you just spoke about a topic that you never otherwise talk about. So quickly I'll be, oh, this is junk. I don't like that. So my advice for people is curate your feed. Why would you want to keep rubbish in your feed? If you're not interested in the content, then just unfollow that person and don't even think twice on LinkedIn, by the way, there is not that follow unfollow culture, like on Instagram or Twitter. It's much less, it's much more subtle. You don't get notified if someone unfollowed you. Um, and people just don't do that. It's just a different type of culture. Um, so thank you so much, Tim. Is there any last parting words of advice you'd like to just leave a up and coming entrepreneur with, um, who's thinking about, Hmm, can content help me? Which platform, like where would they, where would they start next from here? Yeah. So final words I would say is look, go out there, get excited, work on your energy levels. Cause if you've got no energy, none of this stuff's going to ha- happen and make learning your number one priority, as I said before. So I do two courses a month. I'm always learning. That's the whole point. doesn't matter where you learn. Just make sure you're learning every day from courses, books, seminars, whatever it is, and you'll figure out the path forward from there. I love that advice. I used to, I used to say readers are leaders because I think my teacher told me that. And today I changed it. And now I say leaders are learners because there's too many new learning platforms and learning styles reading. I have a dyslexic son. So that really did change my aspect on learning to understand that there's a lot more ways that we can learn. Um, so that's, That's a great way to end this podcast. So everyone, thank you again. Big shout out to you, Tim, for coming on the show. And um, thank you for taking back Mondays for these people. No worries.